after the grave, there is a resurrection Sunday. After the grave, there is another time to come. And so we thank God for it. We greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Blessed Holy Spirit. We are glad for today, a day where we remember what happened so long ago. And because it happened on that day, we know it's going to happen on another day. And so happy Easter to you. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We are glad because Jesus Christ arose. What? He arose from uh, the grave and he has all power. One more time, he is at his place of being omnipotent, having all power, and we give glory to God. So at this time, I am going to pray. We're going to read God's word, and then we're going to hear what he has to say. Let's give honor to God in prayer at this time, and then we want to hear what God has been speaking to us by his spirit. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, another day we come. God, we approach your matchless throne in glory. God, we thank you for the work that you did so long ago so that thousands of years later, what a work it was that we can still celebrate. We can still live in victory. God, we can live knowing that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We know that up from the grave, he arose. Wow, he triumphed over his foes. And because of that, God, you're letting us know that we too can triumph and we will triumph over every enemy, especially that enemy called death, hell, and the grave. So God, as we go into your word today, God, we pray that you'll have your divine way. Holy Spirit, you've talked to us. You've taught us. Now, God, help me, help us to understand your precious word. Have your way. Make the difference today in someone's life. Make the difference in the lives of people in Bermuda, all over the world, so that we would know that you have given us this divine opportunity to know you, whom to know, to know your son, whom to know is life eternal. So, God, have your way in the word today. We'll give you all glory all honor and praise in Jesus name we pray and everyone says amen amen I see we got both working it was a labor but we got it done amen amen um, again I greet you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost amen so glad to be with the people of God there's nothing like being in his midst with his people I certainly honor my husband right here helping me out with one of the uh, cameras uh, Elder Ken Seaman, God bless you to the leadership of Shekinah Worship Center, um, our executive, the deacon board, and my precious members. How I miss being in your presence. It makes a difference. I mean, this is all right, but there is something about being with the people of God. And so we continue to remember the island of Bermuda and the world, what we're experiencing understanding that God yet is in control of everything. We don't doubt it for a moment. Amen. I can't see everyone who is on board, but thank you for being here. I invite you to get share, share it, and let's have people to hear the word of God. And the scripture reading for today is coming from the book of St. Mark. St. Mark, Mark chapter 16, the verses were 1 through 14. On this Easter Sunday, 2020, I am going to read two verses, two verses. Usually it's one. Today it's two, two verses, verses three and four. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. Well, on this Easter Sunday, 2020, I want to minister from the sermon topic, has your stone been rolled away? Has your stone been rolled away? I begin. Stones are interesting. <laughs> yes, in meditating and pondering for this sermon, I thought I would start out with that. Stones are interesting. 
How you think about a stone depends on the way in which you are speaking about stones. Let's investigate. Stones are good and necessary in building homes. We want to make sure that we reach hard stone or, or hard rock, a solid foundation before we begin building. Stones are dangerous and unkind. When you think of little children and them taking up stones to throw at someone. You know, our parents used to say, they used to tell us, now, stones, remember stones don't have eyes. You remember that? Stones are metaphorical. Somebody may say, hey, don't throw stones at me. In other words, they are telling someone not to cast disparaging remarks at them. Then we've heard sticks and stones may, you know, break your bones, but words can never hurt you. By the way, I never believed that. For when the words are actually stony words that are heard and harsh, they will hurt you indeed. You have heard people, you've heard the saying, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. In other words, one should avoid calling out a person on something that they themselves are guilty of, or even worse. Then there are stones of biological origin. Kidney stones, oh Lord. Your kidneys now, they remove waste and fluid from your body to make urine. Sometimes when you have too much of certain wastes, and not enough fluid in your blood, these wastes can build up and stick together in your kidneys. These clumps of waste are called kidney stones. Depending on the size of these stones, <laughs> the pain will be an indicator. Small stones, maybe no pain, little pain. Big stones, they tell me they're like as if one is in labor. Then we have gallstones, gallstones. Your bladder, your gallbladder is a small organ below the liver in the upper right abdomen. It's a pouch that stores bile, a greenish yellow liquid that helps with digestion. Most gallstones form when there's too much cholesterol in the bile. How about that? Now about here, I want to say that whatever stones you are talking about, they ought to be dealt with. Don't ignore the stones. Can somebody say that this morning? Don't ignore the stones. In the Bible, we hear about stones. There are stones that make up altars, the places of sacrifice. There are stones that are gathered so that the place or the occasion is never forgotten. There are stones in the ephod of the high priest to represent the nation of Israel, each tribe. In particular, I want to mention that when people broke the rules of the old covenant, they potentially could be stoned to death. Are you hearing me? Consider this, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the stone that the builders rejected. And under the law, he was put to death. My, my, my. Let me read a little bit about that. Psalms 118 verse 22, it says, the stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. You know, it kind of makes you think that, hey, well, now wait a minute, when I am rejected, when others throw stones my way, I've got to look at this as being not necessarily a detriment or a negative, but somebody positively cannot handle me, yet God will bring me through this stern moment. And then in Matthew 21, 42, it reads, Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head 
of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Woo. First Peter 2 and 27, it reads, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So don't be too, you know, too upset when you're rejected. Jesus was rejected. Don't be too upset when they call you name. They called him names. Church, what we cannot miss is the importance of stones as it pertains to the life of Jesus Christ, the personhood of Jesus. A lot of what has been previously established by builders, hear me, the builders of religion, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, was replaced by Jesus Christ. Let me, let me get that to you again. A lot of what has been previously established in the Bible by the builders of religion, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is now about to be replaced by Jesus Christ. Though rejected by the Jews, rejected by the current church administration of Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus was set to become the very cornerstone which would take things to the next level, the ultimate level. And so what we want, church, is that we have relationship over religion. How about that? A, a personal relationship with God over the relationship of the priest with God. I'm so glad that I can go to God on my own. I'm so glad I don't need a pastor, don't need a priest, don't need a prophet. No, no, no. All I need to do is have a right relationship with God and I can talk to God. I can, I, I can have a moment of intimacy with God for myself. Used to be in the old covenant. The, all the intimacy was left to the priest, but they failed. Huh? They failed. And so God has opened up the way. I'm so glad about it. Glory to God. Listen, the tablets of stone upon your heart over the tablets or tables of stones, the Ten Commandments. Come on now. No longer is it about adhering to those Ten Commandments, but it's about having them in your heart, the essence of what God is saying. So let me now make this general statement, which I shall support in the text. Choose today to let no one, no stone speak for you. Choose today to let no stone speak for you. Rather, roll away any stone, remove any stone, Pass any stern, are you hearing me, that would hinder you from freely being in relationship with our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The question is, has your stone been rolled away? So let's look at the text. And in doing so, let's look at the following three points. Point number one, the stern of their old covenant. The stern of their old covenant. Point number two, the stern of their sight. <laughs> the stern of their sight. And point number three, the stern of their heart. The stern of their heart. Let's deal with it. Point number one, the stern of their old covenant. Let's take a look at verse number one. It reads, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Okay, let's pull out some key factors from this verse that speak to the passing away of the imperfect law to bring us into another covenant, the covenant of grace. We have experienced the loudness and even the anguish of Good Friday. 
this makes sense because birthing is noisy. <laughs> Can I get a witness right there? Hence, the birth pangs of the new covenant to come can clearly be seen on Good Friday. Saturday, or the Sabbath, was a time of silence. <laughs> Let me say that again. Saturday, or the Sabbath, was a time of silence. Let's call it silent Sabbath. Silent Sabbath. For there was about to be a shutting of those things that had suffocated the people into obeying hardened and excessive laws that they had built upon the Ten Commandments. Now when you look at this word Sabbath, it comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. Shabbat. This word means rest. It refers to rest. Put it to sleep. Put it to sleep. It refers to rest. Ain't nothing going to be happening on that Saturday. Put it to sleep. Church, I can clearly remember, and some of you are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. I can clearly remember that after giving birth to each of my girls, all I wanted to do was sleep. Come on up in here now. Come on, come on, come on. After all that labor, all that pushing, <laughs> all that pain, break the baby and go to sleep. You know, that, I thought about that. I said, that's probably why they take the baby. They know that, that, that mama, she ain't going to want to be up right now. She needs, Lord have mercy, she needs time to recover. Hallelujah. All I wanted to do was sleep. The labor had been noisy, painful, and pronounced. The labor had been totally draining of my energy. Oh, I hope somebody's getting it right there. How huh? that that Saturday, that, that day of rest was because I'm drained of what has taken place. What has taken place is now over, and so I need to rest. So hear this. The removal, my God, of that which was in me, it was in me, was no simple thing. No. I had worked in labor and now needed, required rest. I mean, the rest was so needed that no one had to tell me, go to sleep. I don't remember any of the doctors. I don't remember my husband, anybody saying, now, Maria, you should go to sleep about now. Mm -mm. It was automatic that after the labor of what had been, it was now time to go to sleep. The Sabbath day is about rest. The Sabbath day is about a necessary sleep because you have completed a labor and there is something else to come. My God, my God. Postpartum, Lord have mercy. Postpartum declared that I must sleep now because from now on, <laughs> there, there was a little one that needed my attention. Ah, you're feeling me, church. Huh? Life was about to be different. Life was about to be better. Church, this is the essence of why we are Christians. Why we are Christians and not one of those who adhere to the old covenant. Jesus labored. On Friday we hear nothing of him during the Sabbath and then we hear all about the newness of him on that Easter Sunday morning you see Easter Sunday morning is new Easter Sunday morning is different I'm uh, sorry I can't look back now I can't ha I, I know it happened Friday happened Saturday happened but Sunday mornings new huh that's why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday with them vigor and victory because he got up from the labor of the Lord he got up from the time of rest and now he lives forevermore Mm -hmm. Yes, the law of Moses and the prophets was needed, but now a better covenant has arrived. May we never remain so affixed to what was that we either refuse the better covenant, the new thing, 
or we try to live in both worlds. That's what people are trying to do, live in both worlds. I continuously tell you, church, you know I do, that the moment that you mention Jesus, the moment that you mention faith, the moment that you preach from the, the new covenant, you're a Christian. I don't care what day you worship, you are a Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. On this day, on this day, we shall see that there was indeed a shift of seismic proportion as the old stone, ah, I said it right there, as the old stone was rolled away to usher in a new era. That stone had to be rolled away. That stone that was larger than life, that stone that was just a part of who they had been had to be rolled away. The verse says it. The Sabbath was passed. Look in your Bible. That's what it says. The Sabbath was passed. We cannot talk about the Marys in the verse until the statement is made that the Sabbath was passed. It's, it's the first statement. Come on. That on this day, the Sabbath was passed. These women now, these women, these women, obeying their traditions, uh-huh, came to anoint the body of Jesus. They, they came to do what the Lord told them to do. <laughs> they came to do what they had always known should be done. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Tradition was that before bodies were buried, that they were perfumed. However, because Jesus died a few hours before the Sabbath, they could not do that which was traditional. Eee! They could not do that which was traditional. Hence, the women went, <laughs> went to complete a traditional work on Sunday. Do you hear me, church? Do you hear me, people of Bermuda? Do you hear me, people all over the world? They went to complete a traditional work on Sunday. Don't miss that. They went to try to complete what was done to bodies under the law. However, Jesus was not in the tomb. You think Jesus was going to get permission for the law to continue when he had been through what he had been through on Friday? You see, they wanted it to roll the stone away and anoint the body of Jesus according to the old law. No, this could not be allowed, for there was no sweet fragrance or sweet perfume that was to be added to this situation enacted on the law. Don't try to sweeten law. Look, look. Don't try to sweeten the law by talking about Jesus. Don't try to sweeten the law by talking about faith. I'm telling you, I appreciate the teacher. I appreciate the elementary teacher. I appreciate the primary school. I appreciate all the lessons and the shadows of the old covenant. They are teachers indeed. And what they ultimately teach us is that there is a new freedom. There is a new way of living found in Jesus under the new covenant. So they would not be permitted to sweeten up the old covenant. <laughs> Woo, you can't sweeten up the law. The Sabbath was passed. I said that. Come on. And they wanted to complete the Sabbath work. <laughs> Did you get that? They wanted to complete the Sabbath work. They wanted to work it up. They wanted to bring it up. Lord have mercy. Uh-huh. They wanted to complete the Sabbath work that was done to the body of a Jew. Can you, my Lord, can you imagine if Jesus was still in the tomb and they had gotten in there and continued the law? Jesus got up to make a bold statement that even his body was not going to be subjected to the law after his death and upon his resurrection. This is why Jesus had previously, beautiful, this is why he had previously said to Mary at the dinner of his friend's home, let, let me read it, John 12, 7 and 8. Come on. It, it says, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me ye have not always. Come on. 
Remember when, when she broke that alabaster box and she poured out that oil, that perfume? That was the anointing for this day. Yeah, anoint me under your law. But when Sunday morning comes, you can bring all the perfume you want, all the sweet spices you want, but you will not anoint the body of Jesus. Come on. These women had prepared the spices before the Sabbath on the Friday and tried to, <laughs> they tried to deliver Sabbath spices on a Sunday. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? They tried to deliver Sabbath spices on a Sunday. But Jesus was not to be perfumed with the, with the carryover anointing of the old covenant. No. He was on this Sunday, the start of the new covenant in his blood, by his blood, not going to permit an old thing to continue. Verse 2, verses 2 and 3. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? This reminded me of the song, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Yeah, that, that, that's the song. The stone could not have been removed by a human. For if a man or a group of men had rolled it away, it would have been missed that it was the miraculous power of God, his angelic host, that moved the stone away. A man couldn't have moved it. A group of men could not have removed it. The stone had to be removed by an authority higher than the authorities on earth. It was natural and even right for them to want to continue in what they knew. I got it. I got it. That's all Mary, Mary, and Salom knew. However, after Friday and after the Sabbath, Sunday is coming with a new thing. And again, you can't anoint the new thing and the old thing at the same time. There will be no double anointing. This is, a, this is an upgrade. We thank you, old covenant. We thank you, law. And uh, guess what? By us keeping the new covenant, we actually will keep the law anyway. We'll keep the spirit because the latter kill it, but the spirit brings life. I'm, I'm for the spirit. That takes me, folks, to point number two, the stern of their sight. The stern of their sight. Verse 4. Verse 4. And when they looked, they saw that the stern was rolled away. For it was very great. All right. They had to see. They had to. <laughs> for by the law, they were trained to look for things. They were trained to look for works. Uh-huh. The stern had been protected. It had been guarded by Roman soldiers. Yet, here it is, one. At this very moment, no soldiers in place. <laughs> no soldiers in place. Two, no stern in place. No soldiers in place, no stern in place. That's a word right there. Huh? Another indication that that which was done under the law is no longer in place. All of the power, all of the authority that you had under the law to put that stern there, all the soldiers you had guarding to make sure, they must have had an inkling about something, to make sure that that body would stay there. They are no longer in place. The stern's not there. Let that sink in, church. That on this new day, no strength of the law or those under the law, under the order of the Roman law, could stop that stern from being rolled away. Come on up in here. Jesus came to roll the stern away. Jesus came so that they could experience and see that the old covenant of law and the law keepers were not going to be in charge of this next move of God. Come on now. You know, we talk about paradigm shifts. We talk about the next move and making shifts. I'm here to tell you this was a divine shift right here. 
where God had decided, decreed, and declared, and it became manifest that the old covenant would not be a strong hold in the new covenant, that the old covenant was a teacher to prepare you for what's to come. The next move of God would be from above and not from mankind below. No man will get credit. Come on now. <laughs> no man will get credit for what is now in place, the new era of grace. The law, hear me, the law and the prophets had dropped the ball. But Jesus was here, <laughs> and he carried the ball across the line. Come on now. Let's read 5 through 7. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man <laughs> sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Now, I could preach all day and all night. That's a whole lot right there. But I want to I wanna pull out some nuggets out of this. I want to mention them. So rich, but I truly don't have all day. All right, so let's pull out the nuggets. Nugget number one. They saw a young man, a young man. It, it speaks to the fact that young men are needed to carry the new message of hope. You wonder why the enemy is always out to kill the young man? While every time you look, oh Lord, another one going, going out of this earth, going on drugs, doing this or that, huh? killing each other because of this right here. Come on. Young men are needed to carry the new message of hope. Young men are needed for they have the strength of years. Hear me. They have the strength for years to come. Young men, because they are the ones who will get the job done. They're strong enough. Come on. Nugget number two. He was sitting. He was sitting. He was sitting comfortable <laughs> in an empty tomb. Glory. Why? Because of the new thing, he was a courier. He had a message beyond the grave. He, he, he was no longer scared or intimidated or held back by the power of the grave because Jesus defeated it. So he's chilling now. He, he's comfortable. Come on now. He had a message beyond the grave to deliver to these women. They wanted to anoint the body, but the but the body was already anointed because Jesus is the anointed one. Glory to God. Ain't no need to anoint the anointed one. He is the one that anoints us. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Lord Jesus, nugget number three. He is sitting on the right side. As it were, they were living, they were previously living on the left side of the weakness of the law. And this young man is sitting on the right side of power, representing that Jesus was God's, was what? Was at God's right side of power. And, and that Jesus would return to his right side of power. It, it indicated that Jesus came from the right side of power and that now he had returned to the right side of power. That's why we know that there's power in the name of Jesus. That's why we plead the blood of Jesus. Because there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the lamb. No longer bulls, no longer goats, no longer turtle doves or pigeons. But it's all about that one man, the anointed man himself, Jesus Christ. Nugget number Four. This young man was there to deliver a message in the presence of two or three witnesses. Wow! Because it was good. the message had to be established. 
And the word of God tells us that a thing is established in the sight of two, three witnesses. This day it was established that the tomb was empty because Jesus Christ had arisen. Jesus Christ was alive. Jesus Christ is alive. These women were there at witnesses. Come on now. Ain't nobody going to tell it like a woman. Uh, if you want the message to get out, tell a woman. Uh, don't worry about the telegram or the telephone. Tell a woman. She's going to get the message out. She's going to tell you what it looked like. She's going to tell you what the man was wearing, the young man sitting on the tomb. She's going to tell you how big the stone was. She's going to tell you what the weather was. She's going to tell you everything about that day. It's the details that cannot be missed on this day that Jesus Christ is risen and that God sent a divine heavenly messenger to tell them the message that he is no longer in the grave. Ain't no sense looking for him here. It's empty. He's done the work. And now, now you, you're going to see him. Yes, you will. Come on now. Nugget number five. Nugget number five. Tell the disciples, watch this, and the self-excommunicated one, Peter, the denying one, Peter, that Jesus is coming back for you. Ah, you may have denied me, but, but I know I, if there's a work for you to do. So, Peter, I'm coming, I'm coming after you. Tell Peter that Jesus is going to meet them where he first met them. Go, go and catch up with him. Tell, tell, tell my age boys, meet me around the block. You know, meet me around where, where we first started hanging out. Uh huh. You see, Jesus, hear me, hear me, somebody. Jesus won't give up on you. No, he won't. Jesus will continue the work that he begun with you. That's right. Even though Peter denied him, even though the disciples timed out, Jesus said, I'm still coming back. Because I've taught you enough. I've trained you up. I hear you, Holy Ghost. I've trained you up as children. Train up a child. Train up a child. I spent three years training you. And so the, even though you've gone off track, even though the Good Friday, the crucifixion, you lost your minds and you didn't support me. He said, I trained you enough, so I'm coming back to get you. Glory to God. Let's look at nugget number six. They have an opportunity to move beyond when they deserted the master Jesus. Peter has the opportunity, yes, to do right after wrongfully denying Jesus. So somebody out there, you may have denied Jesus, but I got good news for you. I don't care what, you, you could be an atheist, you, you probably can't stand Christian, can't stand me, none of that even matters. You have an opportunity today that you can, what? You can make a connection with Jesus. He's coming back for you, he's coming back. Yes, he is. So Jesus, he, he was not going to give up on these faulty people. Oh, thank you, Jesus. My God, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad he, he doesn't give up on me. Jesus is not going to give up on the faulty people because they had given in to the pressure of the previous days. He understands us. He understood them. And nugget number seven, nugget number seven, the whole scene speaks to believing to see and not believing because of what you see. <laughs> because Jesus wasn't there. And so that's speaking to the young man and saying, Jesus is going to meet you. He's going to see you in Galilee. So they have to believe that Jesus is actually going towards Galilee right now. And so right there, it's a beautiful thing, right there, God is like teaching them, and they don't even know the learning because he's saying, you don't see Jesus, but you will see him. Can I say that? Can I say that? You don't see Jesus right now, but you will. My God, because he got up on this day, we may not see him walking around Bermuda. We may not see him if we go to uh, Israel, but you're going to see him if you believe. My Lord, my Lord. Huh? And that's why we can have as a preamble of our life, we walk by faith and not by sight. Blessed, we're blessed because we've learned the lessons of the scripture. And we see clearly that God is teaching us in his word that, oh yeah, we're going to see him. We're going to see him. And that takes me to our point number three, the stone of their heart the stern of their heart let's talk about it verse number nine now when 
Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, hallelujah, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Listen, church. When God does a mighty work in your life, you know that you will never be the same. To whom much is given, much is required or expected. And this Mary, I'm talking about Mary Magdalene. Get the right Mary. Mary, oh yeah. This Mary, this one right here. She was so delivered, so healed, so set free. Seven demons cast out. She was so set free that she would experience this moment different from others. Listen, the reason that I worship, the reason that I glorify God is because of what he's done for me. I can't tell it. Yeah. What's, what's what the cartoon say? You can't tell it. Let me tell it. That's my girls. That's one of the songs. What? Because nobody can tell it like you. And so the level of your praise, the level of your thanksgiving, the level of your glory be to God, the level of your thank you, Jesus, the level of your hallelujah is really dependent upon what you know God has delivered you from. You see, when you understand that God delivered you from a, a great thing, from a lot of things, you come in church and you're ready to worship. You don't need to be primed. You don't need to be pumped. You don't need anybody to say anything with you. You come in church ready. I is ready to worship God. And that's why, let me say here, that when we get together again, when all God's children get together at 98, there ought to be a praise. There ought to be worship. There ought not be any grumpy Christians because we recognize that my God has kept us, that we are able to gather together because he kept us. We are able to worship together because he kept us. Not only has he kept us physically, not only has he kept us in our uh, uh, with life, but he's kept us in our sound mind. He's kept us praising him. He's kept us worshiping him. He's kept us wanting to know him more and more. He's kept us in knowing that he has kept us. And for that reason, when we get together, hey, you should be just worshipers. My people should be running up and down. That's my people say the cloth ministry. All that should be happening uh, because why? We are so grateful and no one can stop my praise. This is the kind of Mary that we're talking about. This woman was fully delivered, fully saved, fully returned to her right mind. You wonder why God chose this one? Hey, ain't gonna be no half stepping with this Mary. What? Ain't gonna be no throwing shade about what God has done. What? No, this Mary, oh no, she, she would never forget. Huh? What? Never forget, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. What amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Ah. This is Mary. This is Mary. Do I have a Mary out there? Huh? I ain't talking about the, the gender. I'm talking about the attitude. Do I have a Mary? Someone that knows what God has done. Someone that knows that God has brought them from a mighty long way. Someone that cannot deny the work of the Lord in their life. And forever they will be a praiser. Forever they will be a worshiper. This is the Mary that we're talking about. So she would experience it differently than other people. This Mary, watch it now, watch it. This is so, so sweet. This Mary deserved a double mention at the resurrection day. She deserved it. She is mentioned in verse 1 and here in verse 9. Why? Because this Mary knew what is meant to be alive but dead. She was alive, but in her previous state, she had mental issues. She was demonically influenced. She was tormented. This would have meant that she was not allowed he, to go anywhere near the temple. She was considered a curse herself. Lord have mercy. Yet Jesus 
delivered her. She, she, she knew what it was to be freed from the curse of mental illness and the curse of being labeled as dead under the law. Are you hearing me? Jesus delivered her. Come on. And so now she will be a witness that Jesus, who became cursed for our sakes under the law, was now delivered from death, from the death of the curse, and was now alive. Jesus had new life, and she could relate to that. I'm telling you, this Mary got it like no other Mary could. You see, when Jesus has done a work for you, no one can tell your story. What? Like you can tell your story. Go ahead, testify. Come on, the next time we meet on a Sunday night, testimony time, I expect I'm going to have to limit it. I'm going to have to do a carryover or something because there should be so many testimonies of what God has done. Nobody can tell it like you can tell it. Verses 10 and 11. <laughs> Mary. And she went <laughs> and told them that had been with them as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. They don't want to believe a woman. They don't want to believe a woman anyway because they disregarded women, because they dis disempowered women. They didn't believe that women should be preachers. So why would they believe the women? You see what Resurrection Sunday means to me? Should mean to women preachers? This is, yeah, somebody, go ahead, ask me. Maria, when did you get your license to preach? Resurrection Sunday. That's when. Oh, who gave you permission? The Bible says you're supposed to be silent. You need to go take a look. Take a look at Resurrection Sunday. Take a look at this passage right here. Jesus could have chose that anybody was a witness. Come on. He could have had one of the disciples, had a, could have had Dalton Thomas to go and try to prove something. Could have had Peter return, catch himself. But he chose women. Why? What a passion we have. Huh? That we who were, watch this, somebody catch this, catch this. That we women who were dead, I'm getting this Holy Ghost, thank you. We were dead under the law. What do you mean by that, preacher? We couldn't go into the temple. We had to stay on the outer court. But hear what the Holy Spirit, God at this time says, come on in. Come on in the room. Come on in the tomb. Then carry the message. Carry the message, you evangelists. Carry the message, you preaching women. Come on, tell the story. That's where I get my license from. Come on now. And so church, hear me here. <laughs> Never, my, 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 never be in so much grief, disciples, that you believe not. Never allow human pain and pangs of grief to cancel out who Jesus is. Never allow your time spent in the presence of Jesus to be canceled out when you are going through your own time of sadness. Come on. Can we, we, you, nothing of this earth can cancel out who Jesus is. Let's read verses 12 and 13. And after he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. A whole lot of disbelief. Here the girls are, these women are eyewitnesses, and all oh, these people not believing. Church, hear this. Never be so casual about Jesus dying that you cannot even tell when Jesus is in your midst. Be sensitive to the spirit of God. And then a uh, final verse from this text, verse 14. It reads, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them <laughs> which had seen him after he was risen. In other words, you said, you don't believe the women. Oh, you people are stuck somewhere. Something wrong with you. I didn't just have one woman. I had three of them, and you don't believe. 
You're wrong. He's upbraiding them. He's correcting them. He's trying to set them straight. And dare I say that in the year 2020, we're still trying to set some men straight. How dare you try to shut up a woman when God told her, go and run and tell it. Tell the story. Evangelize about the glory. My, my, my church. The disciples had sterny hearts. Did I say that? No, I could not have said that. Disciples can have sterny hearts. Uh, people that walk with Jesus can have sterny hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. The disciple, they had sterny hearts. They had become callous. My, my, my. Because of the court proceedings, the cross, and the crucifixion. They allowed life circumstances to harden their hearts. They allowed because things went wrong on the job. Things went wrong in school. Things went wrong in my family. Things went wrong with my children. Things went wrong in my marriage. All of life's experiences. Well, that means God ain't faithful to me. Uh-uh. You ought to be grateful that when things go wrong in every area of our lives, that we still have our right mind and that we're still able to praise God, still able to worship God, still able to love God. You know, it's time out for the excuses. No excuses. Jesus upbraided his own disciple. They had become sterny rather than softened in the expectation of remembering that Jesus said it, y'all. He had told them before that he was going to die and rise again. He told them, just like I'm telling you, like the church is trying to tell you, you think this time of quarantine is something? You don't want to be here after the rapture. This is going to be like a picnic. And so listen, church, I want to say this to you. Don't forget your lessons from teacher Jesus when your time of testing comes. This is a time of testing. Come on now. Right? It's a, it's a time of testing for Bermuda. It's a time of testing literally for Shekinah Worship Center. Literally for some of us in a significant way. It's a time of testing. But you think that the time of testing cancels out who Jesus is? who God is, if anything, this time of testing, watch this, catch this, this time of testing actually softens my heart and thanks God that, that, yes, God, thank you for the example in your word that we shall arise after death, that, that this earth is not our final place, that we're pilgrims traveling through. Oh, my gosh. That's why in sorrow I have hope for tomorrow. That's why when I'm going through pain and you're going through pain, my God, we recognize it's not going to last always. Huh? What? It's going to be joy. Listen joy coming in the morning huh weeping's gonna endure for a night and a night and a night but i tell you there's just one morning coming huh? with all of the weeping i hear your holy ghost with all of the sorrow with all of the grief all of that is going to be canceled out by one day one day called morning joy comes in the morning glory to god church listen we will not see jesus now we shall see him in a time and place called eternity. Be sure to keep your heart soft. Huh? No matter what they say, no matter what they do, huh? no matter what they say about you, keep your heart soft. Don't become hardened. Don't become callous. Don't turn your back on the church because some things go wrong. Jesus didn't do that. People did that. They did it to him. Let nothing of this world harden your heart. Let no person or personal experience cause you to expel who you know Jesus is. Keep your heart tender towards the things of God. Keep your heart tender towards Jesus. Jesus did a mighty work to make you strong and not weak. Leave the beggarly elements of the law alone and walk into the new work of faith by grace. Jesus is arisen. Celebrate your Lord and Savior Jesus today. Yes.
because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And listen, not only can I face tomorrow, but I can face tomorrow's tomorrow's tomorrow. In other words, every day I know that because Jesus got up, I'm going to get up. <laughs> every day because he was triumphant over the grave, I know that every child of God, that every child of God that names Jesus and knows Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, you are going to get up too. We are going to arise also. And so because of that, surely because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I'm glad about that. I know about you, but I'm so glad that indeed I can face tomorrow. Has your stone been rolled away? Don't block it. My God, I know, I, I, at this point, I don't care what has taken place. Jesus did not do that to you. Instead, he wants to bring you through. No hurt, no pain should keep you from the love of God. As a matter of fact, every hurt and every pain should push you into the presence of God. So on this day, Easter Sunday, the year 2020, I invite you who do not know, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what? outside of Good Friday, this is the next like highlight day. This is the highlightest day <laughs> when the light of the world got up. So why not let him light your world? Forgetting those things are behind. Decide now to move forward. Somebody needs Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I want to invite you today to make that decision. It, it would be so exciting for me to know that somebody today on Easter Sunday gave their heart, their life to Jesus Christ. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the prayer. And I'm just like, wow, God, let someone on Facebook, let someone on YouTube give their life to Jesus today. And so let's pray. As a matter of fact, if you're a sinner, you want to accept Jesus into your life, into your heart, so your heart doesn't remain sturdy, I'm going to ask you to repeat the sinner's prayer after me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. The day that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. God, I confess that I am a sinner. God, today I make a choice. I choose to ask Jesus to come into my heart. I believe Jesus hung, bled, and died to take away my sins. And since I accept that work today, I give you my life. God, I thank you for making me a new person. Jesus, I thank you because now you are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my soon coming King. Jesus, I give you my life. Help me, guide me, teach me by your spirit so that I remain strong in the faith. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Wow, just like that, just like that. I'm telling you, it's, it's not like a tough thing, it's a decision. And just like that, you have become a member of the family of God. Welcome into the kingdom. Welcome to eternity in heaven. Welcome to a time that is absolutely precious. And I invite you to let me know about it. Our email and one of my members in, in each place, they'll write down my email for you. My email is swim at logic.bm. I want to know, I want to know that you gave your heart to the Lord. Certainly I avail myself, the church, our leadership, that we would be able to minister to your heart. You need a church home. If you're in Bermuda and you don't have a church home, I expect to see you on the first Sunday that we gather together. Hallelujah. 
It's going to be a divine time. And so again, reach out to me at swim at logic.bm. Swim at logic.bm. It comes only to me. All right. I would love to know it, to celebrate you. Thank you for making that decision. Why am I saying thank you? Because it's it's like, because you're gonna add more. Jesus, Jesus had you to exist because you have gifts and talents. And now that you come into the kingdom, we're gonna win now. And we certainly know we win in eternity. So certainly uh, be blessed, amen, and continue to know that we are looking forward to building the kingdom while we're yet on earth before we transition to that eternal place. All right, make your choice. Make your choice now before it's too late. Amen, amen. Uh, Shekinah Worship Center, friends, family, those tuned in locally and abroad, let me uh, give a word of prayer for you and to just let you know that we surely miss you being physically with you, um, in company with you. It's precious. Now we know why God said forsake not the assembly. It should make a difference. It really should. So let me say this, speak this prayer over you and even concerning our island called Bermuda. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this day. God, we thank you that your son Jesus arose. And that because of that, God, we have the hope of eternal life that we win. God, we are in a time that you know the outcome of it. And God, I ask that you'll continue to be with the Shekinah Worship Center family, be with our brothers and our sisters locally and overseas, be with everyone. God, continue to reassure them, reassure us that, that your plan is right on time, that this is our most precious time. Cover them with the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray for the island of Bermuda, the government of Bermuda being led by our premier, Honorable David Burt, we pray for him and his cabinet, his party. We pray for all leaders in government. God, that you will continue. God, give them wisdom in everything that they do. God, may they seek your heart in everything that they do. God, you be glorified in this situation. God, I bring to you our covering, our Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough. God, we thank you for this woman of God who continues to encourage us even during this time. Remember our Bath Rafa family and our Rafa Alliance pastors. God, we thank you for what you will do. Personally, God, I thank you for each family here and certainly my family, mom, dad, and Al, and the rest of the family there in, at the home in Pembroke. God, we, we just glorify you. You're keeping us. Just another day, every day we can thank you for it. Pray that you continue to strengthen my husband and my children wherever they are, that you continue to be with them, protect them, my prayer, the prayer that I pray for my family, I pray for all families. Have your way. We'll give you glory, God. Remember Cameron, hallelujah. God, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We thank you, God. And we love you. Hallelujah. Thank you. We love you in everything for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen, amen, amen.